Right guys, this is a long plane review for Mission Genocide on the Amstrad CPC, released by Firebird in 1987. And this is a much beloved budget game for the Amstrad, famous for being one of the few games to scroll at a liquid smooth 50 frames per second. And made by a wizard of a coder by the name of Paul Shirley, he who is also famous for Spin Dizzy and many others which we'll get onto later. So let's kick things off here. And on the loading screen, what does ZTB stand for? Uh, I hear you ask. Well, it means Zap the Bad Stars. And what does that last word sound like? Well, a rude word which I can't say on YouTube. Think about it. Zap the Bad... Uh, bad that... Uh, yeah, anyway. Needless to say, a name change was requested by Firebird, but Paul kept it on the loading screen there. And handily on the title screen, it shows us the power-ups you want to get here. All that's missing is the uh, is the power-ups that look like the pills or dots. These are glue that allows your power-ups to stick to your ship. So whatever you do, though, don't pick up the black holes there, as they will drain your power-ups. And off we go on a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up. And look how smooth that plays. Yeah, don't pick up the black holes there. Um, doesn't really matter. I'm not going to really describe what each of the pickups are. Just pick up everything you can apart from the black holes. That's all you need to remember and keep picking them up because they will slowly eventually drain away. I think that increases your laser. That increases your missiles, I think, and the other one will increase your speed. And those dots there are the glue. Um, and that allows you to keep your weapons glued to your ship, basically, okay. And there's four gauges at the bottom there. M for missiles, L for laser, S for speed, and G for glue. So make sure your glue is always fully topped up or the others will start draining down. Picking up a black hole will also drain them as well, as previously mentioned. That sound there signifies an extra bonus life. Uh, we've got one there at 10,000 points. And just look how smoothly everything moves, guys, from the sprites to the scrolling. Lots of good stuff going on here. And this is a very, very impressive feat of coding and programming. Uh, level 2, Planet of the Fruit, Zap the Crops. <laughs> so, as we're fighting uh, alien strawberries here, I'll tell you the story of the game. And the story goes, which I'm reading directly from the manual, your planet Christ Sit has been ruthlessly attacked by the Bad Star Empire in an unprovoked assault to subjugate your people. A plan of defence and ultimate counter-attack must be devised by the Christ citizens and forces gathered for retaliatory measures. You are the coordinator of a small crack unit with a deadly mission. You must destroy as much of the Bad Star Empire as possible so that they are sufficiently weakened to prevent them from launching another possibly killer blow to your planet. It. Your briefing is complete. The mission is ready. Code name ZTB Zap the Bad Stars. And there you go. That's the story of the game. Um, so controls, I've just mentioned very quickly here. You can hold down the fire button for continuous laser blasts, but it won't fire missiles that hit the ground target. So you have to keep hitting the fire button for that. Uh, but not a lot of people know that there's an inbuilt auto fire option for the lasers by hitting the space bar. So do that immediately at the start of the game. Get the auto fire on and uh, concentrate on using the fire button for missiles when you want to hit a ground target to reveal a power up. <laughs> and there we go. Level three, taking the uranium. <laughs> yes, um, Mr. Paul Shirley had a, uh, had a had a sense of humour, shall we say. I think it may be a bit of a nod to Iridium as well. This looks kind of like a vertically scrolling Iridium level rather than the horizontally one. Uh, but there you go. Also on this level, we're going to start... I think we start seeing turrets on the ground that start firing back at us. Or potentially that may be the next level. Anyway, um... Right, the key to survival in this game is always making sure your weapon levels are maxed out. You can see the bar charts at the bottom of the uh, uh, screen there next to the score and before your lives and ships. Um, so make sure you pick up more along the route of the power-ups. Um, the manual says get the glue pickup, which is those round dots. There's one and there's another. 
Uh, but I've noticed that picking up uh, uh, an, an one power up, e.g. for example like picking up the speed power up, will also boost the other levels of the other power up sometimes. So just pick up everything basically, just avoid the black holes as mentioned previously. Um, uh, but the key to the extremely difficult later levels is knowing where the shield pickup will spawn, uh, which is always the same location every level, unlike the other power-ups which can be random as we reach, hey, we reach level 4, Riverworld. Um, you can use this shield as a one-hit protection. After taking a hit, it's still in effect for a few seconds, so you can bomb around the screen, clearing enemies and shots before it runs out. Uh, hopefully, you'll make it to the next shield pickup if there's more than one on the level. I think there's one on this level on the right-hand side fairly soon. Uh, might be this one. There it is. There's a shield pickup. Very, very handy. And that was that shield pickup will stay with you throughout the level until you get hit. Um, so basically, prior knowledge of the levels, especially the very last four or five levels, is really needed. And you sort of plan your route almost to the level by where the shields will spawn. So anyway, onto the code of the game. Paul Shirley, most famous for, probably for doing Spin Dizzy, uh, released by Activision in 1986. But he actually started for Amsoft writing Quackerjack, and that's one of my favourite Amsoft games, actually. That, that one actually came with my 464 when I bought it, and I love that one to bits. That highly recommended game. Also, there's a long play of it on my channel. Um, he also did um, the well-regarded Splat for Amsoft. Um, so Quackerjack was 984, Splat 1985 for Amsoft. Um, then he went on to do Confusion uh, for Incentive in 1985. I don't think they like you, says the text there for level 5. Mm. Confusion was a, quite a well regarded puzzle game. I've never, I don't seem to remember playing it personally, but uh, I may check it out at some point soon. Then he went on to do uh, Spin Dizzy, of course, absolutely massive success. Much plaudits and success for Activision in 1986. And then finally, Mission Genocide in 1987. And this was to be his last Amstrad game, sadly. Um, after this, he moved on to the Atari ST, uh, then the Sega Mega Drive. And lastly, and rather impressively, he has a credit for Duke Nukem 3D, the PlayStation port. Hmm. Uh, but I did, uh, and also he seems to be quite a secretive guy. I can only find one interview with him on the uh, internet, um, which is which, which you can find on the dadgum.com website. It's a very old interview, though. Um, so yeah, he's done some very very clever programming tricks here. Not only 50 frames per second scrolling, but it's also overscan into the horizontal borders, as you may notice. Um, so we can get quite nerdy and techy here and confuse a lot of people. Um, but I think some of you will really, really appreciate this. Let's go into some really nerdy de details. So buckle up, all right? Um, Mission Genocide, uh, as we hit level six, inspirations end. <laughs> um, so Mission, Gen Mission Genocide uses a combination of something called Rupture and R5 to achieve the smooth scroll. Uh, without any stability issues. R5 is, is kind of an, a known trick in the Amstrad coding circles. I'll try and explain. So the CPC can actually do hardware scrolling. Um, it just it just doesn't have a dedicated hardware scrolling chip or anything like that. But um, I'll try and explain the best I can. So the CRTC chip, which is the display chip, and CRTC standing for cathode ray tube controller has registers you can change, specifically R12 and R13, to define the start address of the screen. You keep incrementing these values and it will scroll the screen, but of course eventually you will have to update to show the new graphics, etc. It's not entirely smooth though using it on its own, but you can use a different register to help fix this. The R3 register is for horizontal sync, which can have its own problems on non Amstrad monitors. And then there's also the R5 register, which we just talked about, which is for vertical adjust. And that works much better. 
So you're more likely to find vertical scrollers making use of R5 compared to horizontal scrollers with R3. The problem with R5 though, register five, is it can cause instability issues with the screen as we approach Grindworld level seven, watch out for the invisible pods. Um, so you might find uh, weird things happening at the edges of the uh, screen and lots of flickering and stuff like that. So one way around this is to use the rupture technique. And, th and this is used to split the screen vertically. And often it's used to put a static panel that may contain score, lives, energy, etc. whilst the rest of the screen scrolls. Here, Mission Genocide cleverly uses Rupture to fix any rough edges on the scroll that other R5 games exhibit, like for example Legend of Karge and LED Storm. Indeed, it's quite possible Mission Genocide was the first game to do this. And I think they've used a vertical black line at the top there just to mask it further at the top of the screen. You may see a vertical line covering sprites if you look very cl uh, closely anyway um, lastly actually let's talk about the sprites how do they move so fast and smooth without flicker and um, well this is harder to explain again more clever techniques involving drawing sprites using or and removed using and some bits of the bite are reserved for sprites and some for the background. Basically, changing colours where the sprite and background mix, resulting in a simpler a sprite plotting routine, which is faster. Due, due to this, though, you're reducing the number of colours you can use for sprites and backgrounds. Hence why Mission Genocide perhaps isn't as colourful as one would hope. But I hope I've roughly explained that right. Um, please do correct me in the comments if I've got anything wrong there. Um, I should point out there are different versions of the CRTC chip, uh, the graphics chip basically, used um, in the range of AMSA computers. And some of these scrolling techniques can completely fail on certain versions if the coder hasn't done their homework and, and accounted for that. For example, Smash TV will crash when it first tries to scroll on my very own CPC 464, but works fine on other 464s, but they have different CRTC chip versions. Uh, Mission Genocide, to its credit, uh, and its very clever coding techniques, means it will work on all versions of the CRTC chip. So there we go. Uh, just quickly, we're going to talk about other versions. Uh, hopefully that nerdy conversation there will appeal to you. <laughs> I don't blame you if you found it completely baffling and boring, but uh, I know some people will appreciate that. But we're going to talk about the other versions of the game. This did this did appear on uh, two different system, two other systems. Uh, firstly, the Commodore 64. Uh, Paul Shirley also handled this, and in the one interview online I could find of him, he rather disliked this version. But I find that strange because weirdly it's it's pretty much identical to the Amstrad CPC version. There are minor differences like the power up levels are at the top of the screen rather than contained with the score on lives at the bottom. It also scrolls ever so slightly slower than the CPC, but it's by such a small amount it's really not noticeable. The only way I could tell is having uh, both run alongside each other simultaneously. Eventually halfway into a level you actually can tell the Amstrad hat is ahead of the Commodore 64 version by a small amount. Uh, the biggest difference is that it has atmospheric in-game music uh, but no sound effects. The first level um, graphically also looks near identical to the CPC, but later levels where more brighter colours are used, it's arguable that the CPC uh, version looks better. But really guys, there's not much in it. Uh, it's impressive for the Amstrad props, not so impressive for the Commodore 64, which is used which is used to having rather smooth scrolling shoot 'em ups. Um, this also appeared on the 16 bit, or well, at least one of them, the Atari ST. Again, Paul Shirley is porting this himself, and he was now moving over to ST coding full time. Um, this doesn't look very impressive for a 16 bit game though. It scrolls smoothly and has slightly better sound effects than the CPC, but it has no music. Uh, but your ship doesn't seem to move as smoothly as the Amstrad version. And well, a budget game on the ST still costs around a tenner, and this just isn't worth it. Oh, level 10. We've got 12 levels in total, so getting towards the end now, guys. Another outpost. There's a lot of crossfire out there. Yeah, this level is absolutely brutally mental. 
I did not enjoy playing this game at this point. <laughs> it was absolutely horrendous. Know where the shield pickups are, remember, guys? And that's what I went for there. Um, so let's have a look um, at magazine reviews at the time. This was reviewed in the issue 25, October 1987 issue of Amsterdam Action Magazine. Um, well, of course, they really rather liked this a lot and indeed awarded this the AA Rave Award. The only real criticism is a lack of colour and that this may get repetitive. Oh, and they marked it down for missing music and a lack of sound effects. Otherwise, they loved it, praising it for its smooth vertical scrolling, noting the pedigree of the programmer Paul Shirley and his earlier work in Spin Dizzy. Um, so, as for review scores, they gave graphics uh, a rather surprising 90%, um, Sonics 37%, Grab Factor 82%, Stain Power 77%, and an overall AA rating of 80%. As for my score, guys, I'm close to sort of agreeing with Amsterdam Action, and they gave the graphics a rather bizarre 90%. As for the sound effects getting 37%, I think that's harsh. I think the sound effects are actually quite good in the game. But my score, guys. I'm going to give this an 8.5 out of 10. Uh, it's a brilliant piece of coding and a game to show off to sneering C64 fans who tease you that the Amsha can't scroll. Just kidding, we love the Commodore here as well. Um, but hey, look, the Amsha can scroll at 50 frames per second and it's definitely very, very achievable. And it was, even back in the day in 1987, on a, on a simple little budget game. There you go. Uh, but it's a brilliant piece of coding. As for the game itself, well, it depends on how much you like shoot 'em ups. For ardent fans of the genre, it may not have enough action and variety. And for casual players, they may bore of its repetitive nature and its, its rather extreme difficulty in the uh, last six levels or so. Otherwise, it's still a classic and deserves, I, I think it deserves a high score. Um, <clears throat> I, I can live without the lack of colours. I think this looks rather nicely designed. It's neat. Um, you can see everything. You can clearly see your bullets compared to the enemy's bullets. God, I hate those homing uh, missiles. They absolutely suck. Um, I think the side effects are pretty decent for a shoot 'em up on, a, on an Amstrad. And it's absolutely brilliantly programmed. As we f finally get on to level 12. Um, so it just leaves me here to sort of mention things I've got to mention. There was a level there, you noticed a few levels back where we were going underneath the plane area. That's a nice touch. Um, you, you now have turrets that you can't destroy. There's lots of black holes here which you don't want to pick up. So do you really want to be bombing everything on the planet's surface? Although we're slightly underpowered now. And I'm now just being a real wimp and just hugging the side of the screen there, knowing that there's a shield pickup coming up, which I've got. And that's how I'm going to bluff my way through this level and probably the previous levels as well as we saw. Um, the homing missiles I absolutely detest. You basically want to do a sharp turn of direction when one is homing in on you. Um, maybe will we see another of this level? I can't remember. But if you get a homing missile coming in on you, let it get fairly close to you, and like, and then move forward, let it follow you, and then suddenly move back really quickly, and a quick change of direction will get you through. So my shield was just running out there. That's why I was sort of running into as many enemies and bullets as I can, making use of the shield before it disappears. Oh my god, look how tight that was. And I've done it! There you go. That is the game completed. And now we loop back around, unfortunately, to level 9. There's no um, ending, I'm afraid, to the game. It just loops back to level 9. So we'll just kill ourselves here. And um, we'll finish up. Um, so yeah, guys, I'm going to give this an 8.5 out of 10. And this should be praised for its technical achievements, whether, you, whether you're a shoot 'em up fan or not, and whether you think the game is rather too simple or repetitive or whatever. Um, you have to remember as well, guys, this was a budget game at $1.99. Um, I think Paul himself said at a time in an Amsha computer user magazine review that, well, if he was making this for full price, then of course he would have added a lot more in. 
And as you can see here on level 9, this is where you go underground. And I've just seen here how far I could get on my last life by just sticking in the top right corner of the screen. And it seems you can actually progress quite far if you want to. Um, a few little judders there in the uh, scroll, but that's not in-game. That's just, unfortunately, recording, um, dropping frames recording for some weird reason. Um, if you see any of that happen in the video, that is why. But there you go, guys. Thank you very, very much for watching. That was Mission Genocide from Firebird and Paul Shirley. Hope you enjoyed, and see you all again very soon. Goodbye. So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click a like below, leave a comment, and also subscribe if you haven't already. And over that way, there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.